And now for this second part, we'll have a panel on how we can deal with a society that is, has an increasingly long life expectancy. And I have a ple the pleasure of introducing three experts on these topics. They will tell us about their experiences with the matter of uh, longevity. We have Eleanor Barone uh, from the International Center on Aging, and she's the director of the Memory in Motion Between Young and Old. Olga Fuentes from the Superintendents of Pensions of Chile, and Juan Miguel Villa, who is a president of the Colombian Pension Administrator, Colpensiones. We will start with Eleanor Barone. I'll tell you a little bit about her bio very, very briefly. She's very experienced. She has a PhD in architecture. She is an innovation consultant expert in strategic design and intergenerationality. She's worked in many different contexts from universities to private firms. She's been in public administration and NGOs and she is able to interact in multi-sectorial environments and develop a critical view that brings together the public and private perspectives. Currently, she leads MIMO, an intergenerational uh, action-oriented community, uh, which is committed to sustainable cities and communities. She founded uh, this community in 2015. She's also a trainer and communicator on topics having to do with uh, longevity, intergenerationality, intergener and uh, purpose. She lectures at universities and business schools, as well as at national and international conferences. Thank you very much for being with us. It is a pleasure and an honor for you to join us for this ninth edition of the Global Pension Program. You have 12 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Waldo. Thank you. Everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you to Diego Valero, the whole team, and Juan Martín, who is the director of CENIL. And we'll share a holistic vision on longevity, which I'll try to do during these 12 minutes. I'm not an economist and I'm not a pension expert. You need to bear that in mind, but I'll just try to help you think about three aspects that are interesting. What does it mean when we say that we are living in a, a society where longevity is increasing and how can we take advantage of the opportunities that this offers and what decisions do we need to make? When we talk about longevity, we're talking about an increase in life expectancy. Of course, we've added years to our lives, almost two years per decade. That's a lot. A child's born today might be able to live to 100 years old. The last this last year, we lost uh, some of that, but uh, this has nothing to do with our genome. So there's nothing to tell us that we cannot uh, continue to add years to our lives. So we'll have a lot of um, senior citizens in Spain. We have an aging of 125.7%. That was from 2020. Every 125 seniors is for every 125 seniors, we have 100 younger people. So what does this mean? We, yes, we have achieved better conditions. We are rejuvenated as a society, perhaps, but we need to see what we do with these challenges and uh, look at the context of these years we have earned because we want to talk about quality of life as well. So what does it mean when we talk about living in a society with these characteristics? And as I've said, I wouldn't just like to talk about the fact that there are more older people or that the challenges are linked to the number of seniors. That's uh, not reality. What I see is a society where there is a radical change in relations between goods and persons. Let me explain what I mean. And we're not just talking about uh, seniors or those who are alive today, not at all nor does it have anything to do with the idea of pensions and are we just talking about all the money we'll have to spend and pay out 
or anything of that kind. These aspects that are linked to pensions, to demographics, and to care are the aspects that we often associate in our heads with the idea of longevity. And we immediately think that has nothing to do with me. I'm, uh, I'm still young. That doesn't apply to me personally, of course, as you see, I am uh, well on the path to aging. But what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to connect with the idea that we belong to or we consist or we conform a very complex system that includes all the generations and each one is essential for the others in different ways, just like human beings. In nature, there's no waste. We never see it that way. All of us human beings are essential at any age. And the challenge is to consider what actions each person, each uh, organization can take in order to make the most of these challenges. So let's go to the second idea. What are these challenges? And I'll just look at a couple of sectors. The labor market, for example, the world of work. We need to work and we need to deal with a lot more changes in our career paths. Our parents, our grandparents, perhaps some of them had a, a single job throughout their lives. And today, and even more so in the future, we'll see that almost 80% of the population will have to deal with a whole portfolio of different services, not just jobs, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, gig work, contract work, self-employment, volunteer work, and other modes. And speaking of uh, digital uh, progress, artificial intelligence is competing with us in terms of what tasks we do well or well we cannot be, where we cannot be displaced by machines, creativity, consulting, innovation, or those uh, that we consider creative services will not be impacted, but there will be a lot of uh, mobility, a lot of turnover, et cetera. A person who works as an accountant today, for example, might have to be transformed in a person who analyzes the results that a machine puts out and this machine works for him. So this person will now be advising diverse teams on accounting aspects, but from a, a strategic perspective. Now, speaking about care, we always seek transformation because unfortunately, if we had to pay all those informal care workers, our entire family budget or state budget would be blown on that. So if we had a baby boom earlier, now we have a senior boom. But most baby boomers today, of course, are uh, retiring and they will be needing care throughout the, re the rest of their lives uh, to a greater or lesser extent. So now we are focusing more on what we call the silver economy. And we're thinking about all the services and products that the baby boomers or all those people who are aging will be about to consume. But we're not thinking that we're talking about the silver economy as if these were services only for seniors, but who will be providing the services for this new majority? People from other generations, of course, younger people. So here we think again that that value chain of society must work as a whole for the solution of the problems that crop up. The health system, we, need, we know that fragility or what is linked to pathologies of different kinds has not increased with this aging of the population. Rather, it's been displaced. We now talk about functional aging, but we continue to work on putting patches, so to speak, on diseases when we should be looking more for prevention uh, that uh, affects our physical body, our mind, our emotions, our spirit. Nutrition is fundamental from this perspective. How we feed ourselves, not just what we eat, but uh, 
what we read, what culture we uh, participate in, our conversations, as we know, uh, in all the blue areas, uh, Japan, for example, has the greatest number of 100-year-olds uh, in the world. They have something that they call the, the Nikiyai, which is the, the purpose of your life, your life mission, your life purpose. How important is it in this society to have a long life, but then there's the quality of our relationship and that concept, the purpose of our lives. So now we have a new uh, scientific uh, research line, psychoneuroimmunology. It links the neurological system, the nervous system, the immunological system, and the psych psychological or emotional aspect of our uh, being. And it means that uh, we don't need to take for granted everything we learned when we were kids. An example, I was always told as a kid that it was better to eat uh, small amounts throughout the day. I was always hungry. And I took that as the truth. But in the last 20 years, through scientific investigation along this uh, new science, that there is data that goes against this belief. And then going back to another challenge, uh, balance in the way we use our lands or the way to live in villages in a more satisfactory way for the new generations, but also, but others who have all, always lived in the countryside and want to stay there. 53% of Spain's territory is at risk of depopulation and the new movement uh, has uh, been born, people who are interested in new opportunities to provide comprehensive sustainability for these uh, other parts of our national territory. And that's, uh, again, going back to that balance and the relationship between cities and rural areas. Uh, each one needs the other. I don't have time to mention all the aspects we need to rethink, reinvent, reinvent and co-create. I've talked about work digital transformation, care, health, a new rural life, and there are many other aspects as well. But here I'd like to pause uh, to go on to another topic, and I'm almost done. What are the decisions that we need to be making at this time to make the best of the coming situation? And I share in the, uh, in the beginning that living in this new long-lived society means that all the time we'll be looking for a new balance in the relationship between people and resources over a, a fourth or even over a third of products and services that we need today, not even tomorrow, today, haven't even been imagined yet. I'll give you an example as the as the architect I am, the urbanist architect or, or city planner I am. And uh, I'll mention a map. A map is key for anybody traveling in areas they're not familiar with, but you'll have to agree that the map will take you where it wants you to go. It has the what it considers to be or what somebody considered to be the best roads uh, and uh, society as a metaphor for the city planner that designed the map focuses on their own tools, codes that are already there. The ones that tell us what the difference is between a rural ro road and a highway or that tell us where north is. And here I'd like to share a thought. Uh, structures, beliefs, mental structures influence the way we in which we analyze external events. And personally, as well as as a group, we have an unwritten rules. I was saying that how we look at problems influences what solutions we come up with. So we want to have a sense of abundance, of well-being, of quality, not just of quantity. So we need to give ourselves permission to review these um, conceptual and mental maps, our inner structures, because only in this way we'll be able to uh, take advantage of these new opportunities that society is offering us. We need new maps to give us the ability to think that we are the people who are looking at pensions, we need to help them bring together the people who are working today and those who are retiring. If we take a horizontal view, and I'm going to be a bit simplistic here, but if we look at this horizontally, the column of who is working and who is not is just a column. That's all it is. 
So we need to look at our budget system in a horizontal way as well to see if we move the pension funds to another common uh, column. What are the challenges that come up there? The, this uh, other one of dependents that helps us pay for investments, uh, for long-term term care, for people who are dependents. They depend on nothing else other than the state prioritizing the funds that are needed to deal with this. And regarding the labor market, who says that we have to work 40 hours a day? That's just something uh, we've decided. In France, they work fewer hours than in Spain. And what do we think about uh, savings or expenses? What if we change our systems, uh, our payment systems and our how many hours we work, or if each country, we see that countries invest in uh, dealing with uh, health emergencies, for example, but studies in Europe and the US show that investing in homes for homeless people is more advisable, not just to support them and help them go back to a different kind of life, but this will also help us reduce considerably those expenses that are associated with medical emergencies, conflict or accidents or any other emergencies that can happen. And I'm not even mentioning the idea of the minimum universal income. But just by giving people housing, we could change the column of what's an expense, put it as an investment somewhere else without having to invest more money, but supporting the same aspect. Are we supporting national level research to at least verify whether the data we already have from previous years in other countries continue to be valid in today's conditions? What I'm trying to say is that, of course, I don't have the answers. I'm very good at asking questions, but perhaps how some journalists are looking at this or how we ourselves are thinking about this, the fear of not having pensions when we're older, maybe we need to prioritize our state funds differently and reflect from a different perspective. It's not true that there is no work, it's just no accessible for most people, among other things, because we continue telling people that they need to actively seek jobs without thinking that we need to offer individual solutions with emerging organizational pro programs. We've talked about education, university. The university is increasingly disconnected from the business uh, environment. So we need to find these new partnerships and we need to think from a different perspective, not just to raise awareness, train, have change projects and create partnerships. All this is very important, of course, but also at the same time, we need to think that Perhaps uh, we are living in abundance. We just have to look at it from a different perspective. If the pro problem has been generated within this system, perhaps the solution is slightly outside the system. Maybe we need to change our mental structures or at least give ourselves the right to rethink what these challenges are that are in front of us as a society, as a group, always thinking as well about individuals, what is our right, what is our duty as individuals, as society, so that we can move on to a different way to visualize these challenges and rethink them as new opportunities for decodifying what we already have. Eleanor, thank you very much for that presentation. As I mentioned before, we are going to have a Q&A. I would like to turn the floor over to Olga Fuentes, but before I do that, let me just give you a quick bio of Olga, who is an expert in pensions and economy of work with a lot of experience in regulations and supervision of pension systems and unemployment insurance. Olga is the head of strategic research and international affairs at the pensions regulator in Chile. She was formerly the head of the research unit at that organization between 2009 and 2014. She is a vice president of the international organization 
of pension supervisors, EOS, and has also worked with EOS and OECD on a number of different research projects. She is a member of the Global Advisory Board and she has worked on financial inclusion. She was a formerly an advisor in the finance ministry between 2007 and 2009 and was an economist at the Central Bank in Chile in international finance and a research analyst in a number of important projects. She has also been an advisor at the IDB and presented at a number of different international conferences, a professor of economics and finance in Chile and in the US and has also authored a number of articles on pensions and pension fund investments, financial education, evaluations and uh, applied research and pensions, applied economics and macroeconomics. Olga has a master's in finance from the University of Chile and also has a doctorate from the University of Boston. Olga, it is truly a pleasure to have you with us for this event. Thank you very much. We um, have 12 minutes for your presentation. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Waldo, and I'd like to thank the organizers. Thank you for having me to talk about such an important topic. I know that we just heard Eleonora talk about longevity in a broader sense, and I believe it is important to look at longevity and uh, increase in life expectancy comprehensively. I am going to focus specifically on pensions and more specifically this is research I am doing with Richard Fulmer and Manuel Garcia. This is a uh, design for a pension products that can complement what is happening currently on the market in Chile. The way we see it, this is not only sustainable, but also comes with a number of other benefits I'm going to mention during my presentation. Overall, however, this is a recommendation that can be easily implemented and assessed, assessed through a lens of other systems, not only in Chile. Before I begin, I do want to share a disclaimer. The findings in this uh, presentation don't necessarily represent the views of the pension regulator. Now, first we're gonna start with a, an overview of the Chilean pension system. We'll also share information on the main pension products. Then we're going to evaluate the role of this uh, Tontine-like arrangement and look at the added value in this proposal. We'll look at its transparency, flexibility when it comes to investment, higher expected income streams, and has non-explicit guarantees which in a way means that it has variable payouts, but could potentially be higher. We looked at a number of different mechanisms and proposals. We were able to show what this first proposal was all about, how it was designed. One option was that have this variable and sustainable income introduced uh, using a Tontine approach, but in a differentiated arrangement. This proposal was also checked against the other pension products currently offered in Chile. 
en resumen, el, el sistema chileno son tres pilares. El primer pilar. En nutshell, the pension system in Chile is made up of three pillars. There is the solidarity pillar. It is funded through general taxes in order to reduce and prevent poverty. It focuses on uh, benefits, two specific benefits, one basic option for those who never contributed to the system and a supplement for those who have self-funded pensions under a certain threshold. The second pillar is the mandatory pillar for individual accounts. This is a defined contribution. And the third is the voluntary pillar. The sum of the individual savings, both a mandatory and voluntary, is the cumulative balance that the individual will then have to determine uh, how it's used for its pension. And they have different pension products to choose from. The different options for the pension system in Chile has uh, one of the options being the immediate annuity or deferred annuity in the temporal rent. And that's about a two or two and a half year or up to three year deferment for that second option. There's also the scheduled retirement. And we have defined this option in, in the following way. So we have the PW by choice, and this is for those who can self-fund a pension above the basic option. They can actually choose one of the two options. Those who have saved little and are unable to fund their pension above the basic threshold then they can go with the scheduled um, scheduled pension. You have the requirements that have to be met for the solidarity pillar. Then you have the supplemental funds for those who meet other criteria. And then you can also get longevity risk coverage if you qualify. What we can understand from this risk coverage and from the different options is that when we look at who benefits from these different options, the percentage of the scheduled retirement folks is relatively high, but this is particularly true for women who tend to have smaller balances, who have also contributed less. We can see that most of these women are also part of the scheduled retirement by default. We see the percentages here broken down by men and women with a total. See that for the second option, we are at 11% total, 7%, 16% women, men respectively, as well as the numbers for the other options. What we can see from this breakdown is that the immediate annuity, these are lifelong annuities, they are higher. As other presenters have already mentioned, the increase in life expectancy and how much longer people are living, also decreasing interest rates. This means that someone retiring now receives a pension benefit that's 40% lower than what they would have seen retiring in 2000 with the same cumulative balance. This is the impact from increased longevity and decreasing interest rates. That all plays an important role in making sure that the pension received is adequate. In Chile, there has been a relatively high annuitization rates 
This is relative to other countries along the last few months. There has been a downward trend. There has been a lot of discussion recently around these uh, scheduled or programmed withdrawals or PW and the discussions around how it can be improved and how there can be new options introduced to perhaps um, have better coverage of the longevity risk. In terms of a PW, some of the limitations that it faces has to do with, uh, in the beginning, there being relatively high income levels, but these income levels are not sustainable over time. The uh, PW arrangement has a uh, contribution uh, pattern that shows a downward trend. You have uh, the risk now of individuals withdrawing their pensions of outliving their savings. And then you also have this next item here, and that is that pension adequacy should be seen as relevant not only at the time of retirement, but also in the long run. When the person who retired at 65 or at 60 turns 80 or turns 85, it's important to also assess how adequate that pension is then. We also know that with programmed withdrawal, the older you get, the less you can receive. And this is a particularly difficult challenge for women who tend to live longer. Our proposal is based on this principle, the Tantan principle, with individuals receiving payments during their lifetime, when they pass away, goes in their accounts, goes into the savings of the contributors who are still alive. Therefore, there is a redistribution of the balance for uh, pensioners who die. There are longevity credits that can increase uh, payouts for survivors. Generally speaking, there is a, the product here and what you select as your product ends up being an irrevocable option to enforce its risk sharing nature. These are also open-ended pools that continuously take in new members in perpetuity. Payouts also vary depending on investment performance and the mortality experienced in, a, in the group. In its design as well, there's no inclusion of explicit guarantees. Uh, as in the case of lifetime annuities. So the cost here, if we can call it that, it can turn into higher payouts for contributors. There are also options offered to the members on the investment portfolios to choose and how payouts are designed. For example, there can be increasing amounts paid out over time. There's also an upward potential that can come from how investments are made. The different options can also be combined in a way that brings them into line with the indifferences in the specific circumstances of an individual. 
they can also be designed to provide for some of the specifics of these different collective options. Now on methodology, this is the uh, Monte Carlo simulations model. I won't get into the details of that, but it is uh, run in perpetuity. It uh, always takes in new members. The size of the a group was simulated at 10,000 participants, and there are different mechanisms for the randomization of the selection. In terms of results, here we see what the program withdrawal versus a Tantine analysis looks like. We also have this graph here showing the payout decomposition see that the mortality credits at older age account for 80% of the total payment being received by a given contributor. We made a comparison here that uh, was also very interesting. So if I have a deferred tantine over time, you can have a very low percentage that can provide for stable payups and have that still significantly uh, exceed programmed withdrawal. Here we have an extension of the first uh, idea. This is an extension of five additional years and I only need 4% of the total balance to be used for the Tantan in order to get this payout. This makes it all very attractive for anyone who wishes to keep their payout level stable and contribution level, uh, level stable, but who also want to leave part of the savings as what go, then goes back into the fund. This is a solution therefore that can significantly increase uh, the level and stability and sustainability of these PWs that can be designed transparently and efficiently. In fact, it can also allow for a national pool of risk or longevity risk that can take advantage of low cost and economies of scale. It also allows for interesting areas of innovation. You can recognize, uh, for example, different levels of life expectancy and heterogeneity with different socioeconomic groups and uh, CDC and Tantan like arrangements, easy to incorporate with the CDC feature and the proposal. And uh, with that, I will close. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to answering any questions. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for your time, for accepting to be with us for this ninth edition of the Global Pensions Program. Now, uh, to wrap up this last panel, I would like to turn it over to Juan Miguel Vija, who is uh, an economist from the um, Haverian University with a PhD in investment uh, poli politics. He was a uh, social protection specialist and advisor on impact assessment and advised the IDB on a number of different projects as well. He's been an advisor for a number of different UN agencies and other multilateral organizations and national governments and subnational governments in Colombia, in Latin America, in Africa, and Southeast Asia. He was an honorary researcher in Manchester University and a PhD visiting professor on development economics, and also led a number of research projects in 
African Latin America. He was a contributor to a number of different research projects on development, workforce formalization and public policy formulation. Since November 2018, he has been the president of one of the largest SOEs in the country called Compensiones. Juan Miguel, a warm welcome to you for this ninth edition of the Global Pensions Program. It is really an honor to have you on our panel. Thank you very much. We look forward to your presentation. It'll be 12 minutes. And at the two minute mark to the end, you're going to hear a light bell. Well, no, thank you, Alden, and I hope that you can hear me. And uh, let me also acknowledge my co-panelists, Eleonora, Olga. Hello, everyone. I want to talk about the issue that we are discussing as part of this panel, which has to do with the challenges linked to longevity, particularly uh, when it comes to the defined benefits plans, which we focus on in uh, our company. And we have heard a couple of these already mentioned by Olga when it comes to the pension systems, whether they are defined contribution or individual funded pensions. Looking forward to being able to talk about this in a context of uh, what we work on. When it comes to defined contribution, we have the longevity issue that needs to be taken into account, but so far, a part of those risks are passed on to the pensioners. On the one hand, this is because there are stronger requirements for savings and to ensure that there are adequate pension contributions and levels coming out. But also this has to do with the retirement products that, that exist in the insurance market that focuses mainly not only on the work that has been done in Chile, but also in Colombia and in other countries where these kinds of insurance alternatives are offered on the market and how to, for example, uh, cushion and then pay into these different funds to cushion the risks. And all and how that all is linked to the capital market and trends. The defined uh, benefit option here, we have this graph that shows what the pensions payouts has been. This is in the insurance market in Colombia. Only 9.1% is what we have as of December 2020 for pensioners who had a lifetime annuity that was managed by an insurance company where other pensions uh, fell into the programmed withdrawal option. And that came with all of the challenges that we have heard. Also, it's important to understand that in Colombia, now there is a restriction on how much can be saved under the defined contribution plans. And there are requ requirements in terms of how much needs to be saved as well to account for what will be needed in pensions. And that is because if you have a pension on someone who earned a minimum salary, they won't be able to get the kind of levels of payouts that the constitution now calls for. So in Colombia, there is no pension payout that falls below the, the floor established by the constitution for what everyone needs to receive. And all of that was taken into account when looking at the monthly contributions, as well as the longevity risks. Once again, what we have seen is that these risks linked to longevity have been passed on to the other parts of the system. And that is because right now there is no total balance between what has been uh, accumulated. What we have seen in Colombia is that there have been more implicit subsidies given by the system. Because the payouts now don't line up with the contributions coming from young people. 
And as it was already mentioned, what we are seeing trend wise is that we are getting people who are living older, who are living more with better health into an older, an older age with a lot of young people who are not uh, contributing at the part that uh, at the level that needs to be achieved. We have uh, these different risks that we have assessed. And so we have uh, 1.059 million people who are under this category of uh, pensioners given their age. We have uh, survivors on the right. We have those who have a disability on the left. We have broken this down by men and women. And these are people who are receiving pensions at all times. We know that Colombia has not been spared by these demographic shifts that have been discussed with uh, people living longer and what that has meant for other parts of the world. Over the last five years, actually, we use 2016 to 2021 as the reference period. And the first graph here on the left, we see the average age at which someone asks for their pension for the first time, given their age, that has gone down in 2016. For men, this was 67. That has gone down to 64. And now there are also more people asking for their pension at that age. And so the retirement age in Colombia is 62. But we have seen that there was a... Uh, fairly rapid drop in the age at which we started to see people cash in. We're seeing that a lot of uh, pensioners are asking for their pensions uh, closer to retirement age compared to the past, and but we're also seeing that people are living longer. And we see that in the pensioners who are in the the second column here, and essentially what we are seeing as a trend is that people are retiring and asking for their pensions earlier. We saw that 749 people were above 100 years old. That was in 2016, but when we fast forward to 2021, we're almost 1,500 pensioners who are 100 or older. And so these are extreme cases for pensions. In terms of the average age of the deceased, we saw an increase as well, 2016 versus 2021 with beneficiaries being survivors for the most part. And then also for every year that the age of death increases, increases a pension for a minimum salary, the implicit subsidies that are needed to cover it would increase increased by 1.6% according to our calculations in terms of the contributions and in terms of uh, the type of life that we do our actuarial calculations for we do use Colombian pesos we're talking about 90 million pesos that's for minimum salary but if you're taking almost twice 80 million in subsidies as such according to the way uh, those pensions are paid in the period during which it is paid, we see that women have a much larger implicit subsidy because the uh, life expectancy is uh, higher and the salary tends to be lower. And we have 109 year old people in our pension system and there's a lot of pressure by the scheme as well as from the fiscal perspective it could be double the amount of uh, implicit substitute sub subsidies in terms of normal life expectancy and then for women it's not double it's not twice but it goes uh, tends toward an increase in the number of implicit subsidies or the amount of them 
that the payment of this pension requires. So this leaves us with a, a discussion that is rather complex in terms of how to deal with and face this level of longevity that keeps increasing for Colombia, for example, by 2050, we'll have an 82 year life expectancy. Uh, and then by the end of the century, it will be up to 88 years old as expected. So what are the measures or the options, parametric options that will help us address this situation? We have um, various diverse possible responses tying it to retirement or rather indexing life expectancy to retirement age or or the uh, replacement uh, rate also. So we need to study the possibility that life expectancy or retirement age could be indexed to life expectancy. So at least there's a one-to-one -one ratio with a more direct approach to this increasing longevity that we're seeing year after year. That would be the only intervention so far. And the discussion as to whether to simulate this type of measure or what would be the most efficient one, it goes a bit beyond the time uh, that has been allowed, allotted to me for this presentation, but I hope it was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Miguel. Thank you for your presentation. It's been very interesting. We've received a few questions from uh, our audience. Unfortunately, we will not have time for all the questions, but we will try to answer as many as possible in the time we have. One first question for Eleonora. What do you think will be the main change for our society as a result of greater longevity and what should we focus more on? Okay, thank you very much for the question. I'm speaking from the point of view of an individual and it's just my opinion, of course. There's a book by two Americans, uh, Life of 100 Years, I recommend it and if you're, it helps you see how you can plan these changes, plan for these changes in your life. And I think the greatest difficulty in all of this is that humans, as homo sapiens, we are curious, we like to explore new territories, but we are at the same time resistant to change. And now with this new society, it's globalized, it's more technological more unequal, more global, more accelerated, we'll have to do these courts changes more frequently. So for many people having to uh, think about again and again, what do I need to do for my future? How can I be financially independent? Uh, this job that I'm doing, I don't like it. Maybe I could do something else or I could do several things at once. So the short term, Today, we need to look at it, but we also always have to have that view to the horizon more long term as people, as organizations and as society, we have to keep our eye on the long term. If we're going to live 120 years, I need to continue to learn. I need to uh, get to know myself better and know others better. What type of things would I like to do to be fulfilling my purpose, to be healthy, happy? Uh, maybe I can discover talents I have that many of us might die not knowing that we would have been spectacular violinists, maybe because we never had a chance to pick up a violin. So it's the redesign of that path, having the time, uh, devoting the time to designing it, reading, coming up with projects, having projects. I think that is a great uh, tool for personal and uh, group development. And that's what we need to have for sustainability, for all of us together, for people, for a system. We can't tell social security 
pay me back if I'm eating a donut, a whole box of donuts every day. I'm sorry, I'm bringing up um, nutrition again, but we have a shared responsibility. So we need to rethink the way we live, our relationships, how we want to contribute to this society because we are essential. In Hidai, in Japan, they tell us this, the world needs us at every age every generation, we need to exercise that right and we need to be willing to change and to redesign our path and re, uh, reroute our path one again and again. Thank you very much. Now I have a question for Olga. A few questions had be, have been asked about this proposal of the Tontine system, and uh, I'll bring a few questions together as one. How is this system compared? How does it compare to annuities? And a, another question is, how are they different from other longevity uh, types of insurance? Eh, bueno, that, that do the same thing, but with a previous uh, previous contribution. Well, thank you for the questions. The answer shares is that uh, this does share a few characteristics with annuities. The difference is that what we propose does not include any explicit guarantees, as is the case with annuities and another element that we see in our simulation is that these could be combined with other schemes, a temporary income, a 20-year deferment, for example. You need only a low percentage of the tontine to have a pension level that is stable. And it allows a person if they want to leave a bequest, it allows them to do so. The design allows for it. So the difference between a product like this one and an annuity would depend on the individual's preferences, what they value most. Do they want to leave part of their balance as an inheritance? Do they want uh, certainty as to a certain level of pension that they'll be receiving or do they want to have a probability of having an income that might increase based on the mortality of others and the return on the investments and this can be complemented and in fact in a document we also provided some estimates dividing uh, the pension savings by a temporary income a ton deferred tontine or as a percentage of an annuity and regarding the other proposals are just alternatives that can be evaluated they all share a certain level of risk in this case it's not necessary to make an additional contribution to be able to fund it. It's actually added as a pension product. And at the time of retirement, I can see if I will assign a part of my balance or allocate a part of my balance to this alternative. Thank you. A question for Juan Miguel, since he mentioned how life expectancy has increased and the impact this is having on colpensiones. How feasible do you think it is that in the short or medium term, there will be parametric adjustments that will be able to address this new longevity? Well, I think this type of proposal of parametric adjustments is always on the table how to optimize the balance between the accumulation and decumulation phases. Almost all of these target uh, individualizing the profile of the pensioners to make it more directly adjustable to what they have accumulated during their uh, phase when they've been working or saving. Very few of the proposals that we are considering target the system as a whole within 
an intergenerational solidarity scheme in this regard. It, in the group, it seems that every time there's going to be a reform, people talk about increasing retirement age or reducing payments. Our social contract has always been very concerned with retirement age and the economic policies uh, around uh, this uh, issue always go to the same option. So we'll have to have a discussion as to what the minimum pension is in the country and especially what is the me mechanism that would allow us to at least index retirement age to life expectancy since its life expectancy will continue to increase during the first part of this century. And by the end of the century, as I mentioned earlier, it will amount to almost an additional decade. What we are calculating is that for every year that life expectancy increases, and that's for our entire actuarial calculation for people already on pensions, it's the increases two points of the GDP for our uh, pension liability. So if the life expectancy of the population is like what we have for the retired population in current conditions will have an increase of 20 percentage points of the GDP already. And the only way we can deal with this is if we can index retirement age to life expectancy. Thank you very much. Now I have a question for the entire panel. If you could give us a brief answer, not more than a minute long, how should the labor market adapt to this increased life expectancy? First Eleonora, then Olga, then Juan Miguel. Just a very brief answer, just the last message for the audience. We have over 200 people uh, listening to us. Yes, from my perspective, as I was saying, the project is an excellent way to propose solutions. From my perspective, if I'm unemployed, Rather than looking for a job, I should look for what I am capable of doing, what I like to do, so I can then offer that to organizations and to the market. And then organizations should become more transparent. They have uh, issues trying to find people with the qualities and characteristics they need. So we need to go back to hiring older people when very often now we're looking for very young people and then basically forming more partnerships between groups. You send a CV, a resume, that's great. Finding a project to collaborate with other entities from another perspective, if I'm unemployed and for organizations from my perspective, don't just find people who want to work eight hours a day. It's great to work as part of a pool or in a hybrid mode at different ages or in different ways that combine various factors, not just what we have been doing forever. That's my opinion. Olga, thank you, Valdo. Very briefly, I want to echo the words of Professor Nicholas Barr. We need more flexible labor markets. We need labor markets that can in some way help people go through that transition in a smoother way into retirement. And from that perspective, we need to establish that link with pension products in such a way that we allow for that flexibility and in a way that helps us design systems where through time there's a profile that is aligned with that greater labor flexibility and a more gradual transition to retirement. I think that would be a good mechanism to help uh, senior citizens work until a uh, an older age. Thank you very much, Olga. Juan Miguel, we are in a trend where a greater proportion of our population is going to be older or over 60 or 65 years of age. They're 14 percent, but they will be 30 percent by 2050. All of us who are here will be part of that population by 2050. And if we look at their circumstances, 25% of that 30% of the population in Colombia's case will not have a pension income. 
and that will represent a threat as well to our development in the country and that's something that we need to work on immediately why does this happen because we have trusted that one day the labor market will behave in an optimal way and we'll all have an income uh, a pension when we need it but that's not happening and we're not achieving coverage levels that we should have in the country given our income levels so how can we make sure that we don't make our future income dependent on our current labor situation perhaps uh, we can work in a much more flexible flexible way or, or maybe when there's a non uh, paid unpaid how uh, work at home many people do that and then they get to their old age and they have no retirement benefits and that is a discussion that is still a very much an incipient one in the country <laughs> 